Thank you very much. I welcome the opportunity to present on ICHQ3D elemental impurities, and I'm very uh, honored to have been asked by the organizers. As typical the legal statement, the views I'm expressing in the presentation this afternoon are those of myself and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the National Institute of Food and Drug Safety Evaluation or the Ministry of Drug and Food Safety, ICH, or any of their officers, directors, employees, volunteers, members, chapters, councils, communities, or affiliates. This presentation makes use of materials copyrighted by ICH and are being used without modification under a public license provided by ICH. I hope to be able to cover over the next hour uh, the development of the guideline, an overview of all of the sections of the guideline, and share with you some current in-process revisions that have been extent implemented to extend the guideline to cutaneous and transcutaneous routes of administration. As time permits, we'll discuss a little bit about some of the past implementation challenges of implementing the expert working group's work on the ICHQ3D elemental impurities topic. The guideline started development back in 2008, 2009 with the formation of the ICH expert working group, which worked initially to define the elements of concern and we broke into two different subteams. One, the safety subteam that was put together primarily of toxicologists to define the process, to establish PDEs. I'm sorry, I'm getting some feedback. The define the process to establish PDEs, evaluate rel relevant safety information for each element, and to propose permitted daily exposures for the elements of concern. The second team that was formed within the expert working group is was one of surrounding quality in order to define potential sources of elemental impurities to be concerned about, to develop processes to conduct risk assessments, to determine the potential for inclusion of elemental impurities in drug products, and to provide guidance on establishing appropriate controls for those potential elemental impurities in the drug product. And finally, to provide some practical tools to support implementation of this in the industry. Step 2A of the guideline was published in June of 2013. And by November of 2014, the final step four document was signed off by the expert working group and the governing committee of ICH. The, the guideline became in effect in June of 2016 for new products and for products that were completely uh, we're currently commercially um, manufactured and distributed. Existing products were, ex that deadline was extended to January 2018. So today, for all ICH countries, the work, uh, the information and in the guideline is now in full effect for all products new and cu currently available on the market. The del deliverables of the expert working group were the final guideline, final permitted daily exposures for the 24 elements, training materials, which can be found on the ICH.org website under the Q section, case studies that reflect potential approaches to evaluating elemental impurities in drug products, some frequently asked questions that we've developed over the years, and dates for the implementation. In addition, the expert working group developed a revision process. This revision process was implemented in September of 2016 to extend the concepts of the guideline to transcutaneous and cutaneous routes of administration. The expert working group was broadly represented. It included toxicologists and chemists, as I mentioned before. It included the membership from regulators for FDA, EMA, and MET. MHLW in Japan, but we also had representatives from South Korea, EFTA, WHO, Health Canada, Chinese Taipei, China, and Brazil, as well as the pharmacopoeias from USP, Pharmure and the Japanese pharmacopoeia, Pharma, FPA, and JPMA from the industry representation, as well as industry representation from IPEC, WSMI, IGPA, and BIO. So it's a very broad based group with many experts contributing to the development of a practical standard moving forward. The guideline itself was broken down into seven 
independent sections and four appendices that covered specific topics. I'll go through each of these in a little bit of detail as we move forward the, through the presentation. Uh, this is probably one of the more extensive guidelines that was developed in ICH to provide the data behind the decisions that were made in the guideline and the recommendations, especially around the permitted daily exposures for the elements concerned. Some general principles that the expert working group established from the beginning is we wanted to ensure that the PDEs established provided safety based on limits to patients exposure and that they were suitable for all patients across all age groups and categories. Q3D section seven provides options for converting the permitted daily exposures to concentration limits within the drug product to enable a little bit of flexibility for industry and regulators to evaluate the information provided in the risk assessments moving forward. The concentrations derived from the PDEs may be were permitted to be used during the risk assessment to evaluate the significance of the predicted levels of the element in your impurities, as well as to compare those levels with actual empirically derived information. Concentrations derived from the PDEs can be used to convey the suitability of controls on elemental impurities. In the guideline, the concentrations that are included in that assume a 10 gram daily dose of the drug product, which is an, a conservative estimate in most cases, providing some guidance and some flexibility in evaluating the potential for elemental impurities moving forward. One thing that was important to include is that we did not want the guideline to be overinterpreted by uh, industry or regulators to tighten limits based on process, process capability or empirical elemental impurities I, levels identified in the materials under study. The levels that were provided were determined to be safe. They were permitted daily exposures for the elements and that as long as those levels are not exceeded in the drug product, then no further controls would be required moving forward. And again, the limits were not, should not be tightened beyond what's already published in the guideline. Additionally, the, applica the applicant can look at a number of different calculation options and evaluation options in the guideline. Two major approaches are provided. The permitted concentrations may be used and or the absolute limit of the elemental impurity under con of concern during the assessment. These are very useful in looking at completing the risk assessment along with having discussions with suppliers regarding upstream controls or material controls needed to ensure that the elemental impurity levels in the drug product are not exceeded and to convey information on the controls in regulatory submissions. Sources to be considered when applying the evaluation for elemental impurities and drug products, we looked at two different approaches. Uh, one is the components of the drug products, primarily the drug substance and the excipients, but also considering the potential to include elemental impurities from container closure systems for some drug products, manufacturing equipment, especially as in res with respect to active ingredient manufacture, and where it's determined the container closure system or the manufacturing equipment can contribute significantly to the drug product. When that is not the case, they do not necessarily have to be included in the option calculations moving forward. Finally, to getting into the meat of the guideline, the guideline scope, it applies to new finished drug products, new drug products containing existing drug substances drug products containing purified proteins, polypeptides, including those prepared from recombinant or non-recombinant processes. They're the derivatives of those materials and products of which they are components, for example, antibody drug conjugates. Drug products containing synthetically produced polypeptides, polynucleotides, and oligosaccharides are in scope. And Biological and biotechnologically derived products are also within scope of ICHQ3D. However, there are some things that the guideline does not apply to or is one, was not intended to apply to. Those include herbal products, radiopharmaceuticals, vaccines, cell metabolites, DNA products, allergenic extracts, cells, whole blood, cellular blood products or blood derivatives, dialysate solutions that were not, are not intended for systemic circulation, 
and elements intentionally included in the drug product for therapeutic benefit. Finally, advanced therapy products, gene therapy products, tissue engineering products are also out of scope of the current ICH guideline. Drug products used in the clinical stages of development are not considered to be in scope of the guideline. However, the principles and the information that can be gained early in the development process regarding elemental impurities in the drug product being developed can be very useful in establishing the need or the absence of a need for additional controls to pre prevent the inclusion of elemental impurities in the drug product prior to commercialization. So while they're not within scope, it's prudent to begin looking at them during later stages of the development to establish whether or not con controls and specifications are required. The, the, one of the main parts of the guideline is to determine the safety of elemental impurities as they're, as they're present in drug products. The process for evaluating the safety or the toxicity of the elemental impurities included a significant data evaluation. There are a number of ways to set toxicolo toxicological limits, and those include data evaluation using minimal risk level approaches through nationally established standards but, and applying uncertainty factors where enough information is not known regarding the in vivo exposure of the elemental impurities. Where there's limited data, we also included some approaches where limited data is avail is was not available sorry, where data was not available for the elemental impurities of concern for certain routes of administration. During the process of evaluation, we established permitted daily exposures or limits of the presence of the metal in the drug product or metal or elemental impurity, and it also established an acceptable limit or process to calculate an acceptable limit for those that were not listed in the guideline but may be concerned of concern during the evaluation of the drug product based on either quality or safety concerns that the manufacturer may have. So we have ways to cover those that are within the guideline and those that may be a concern outside of the guideline. Some key definitions so that we ground ourselves in a foundation. Permitted daily exposure, which I've talked about already, or PDE, is the maximum acceptable intake of an elemental impurity in a pharmaceutical product per day. And this level has been established to ensure safety for all patient populations. From a toxicological standpoint, the minimal risk level is an estimate of the daily exposure to a hazardous material that's likely to be be acceptable with a, without appreciable risk. Modifying factor which will be used in establishing the PDE is an individual factor that's determined by professional judgment of the toxicologist and applied to bioassay data or in vivo data, animal data, to relate the data to potential human safety challenges. And it's following similar principles as were described in ICHQ3C, uh, which is subject of a future talk here. And finally, safety factor is a composite factor that is applied to a risk assessment once we evaluate the elemental impurities that may be present. The experts will ev evaluate that data from converting from a no observable effect level to a no adverse effect level, depending on the availability of the data. The gold standard is no observable effect levels in the toxicology. However, not all studies have achieved that. So the safety factor is applied to ensure that that variance or that variability in the data or the knowledge of the data or the safety of the material moving forward can be addressed by taking a slightly more conservative approach. The following factors were considered during the development of the PDEs, and this is from a toxicology perspective. The likely oxidation state of the element in the drug product, as some folks will have experienced, some oxidation states of some metals are more toxic than others, but are also potentially less likely to be present in a drug product. Where available human exposure and safety data was used as a first step in evaluating the safety of the material, where that is, was not available, the most relevant animal studies were evaluated from the literature. <clears throat> 
And then finally, route of administration and relevant toxicological endpoints were considered when assessing and establishing the PDE, the potential PDE or the recommended PDE. A number of government organizations and regulators have already begun looking at some of these uh, materials, elemental impurities, years ago. And so there are standards for daily intake of some elemental impurities in food, water, air, and occupational exposure. Where that data was available and appropriate for the assessment, those standards were also considered in establishing the permitted daily exposures. And then finally, where we had information in the MRL, the threshold limit value or time limited time weighted value approach and reference dose estimates were used to establish the PDEs moving forward. When the MRL was used to establish, let's look at an example for using cadmium and the cadmium oral exposure. In a number of oral exposure studies, cadmium was tested in rats and mice and showed no evidence of carcinogenicity. So it was not a carcinogenicity endpoint that was evaluated. However, toxicity, um, the toxic endpoint is really acute renal toxicity for cadmium and cadmium salts, acute and chronic, for the acute and chronic exposure. The renal toxicity was established as the endpoint to establish the oral PDE for cadmium. In looking at a number of toxicology, toxicology studies and summaries, the ATSDR or the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry in the United States is an organization that evaluates a number of materials for car their carcinogenic potential and toxic potential and public publishes updates on those on a periodic basis. In the most recent guideline for cadmium, ATDSDR established an MRL of 0.1 microgram per kilo of for chronic exposure to set the oral PDE. This actually happens to be consistent with the WHO drinking water limit of 0 0.003 mg per liter per day also, which was established in 2011. So using this reference dose, the PDE was calculated by converting the exposure, 0.1 microgram per kilo, to an actual value for microgram per day by assuming a 50 kilo weight of a patient or an individual. So the 0.1 microgram per kilo per day translates to a five microgram per day exposure to PDE. Exposure to cadmium would be the established safe or acceptable level of cadmium in a drug product moving forward. The general methodology to calculate the PDE, as I mentioned earlier, a number of factors can be used to evaluate that based on the data, and these include the use of modifying factors. In this case, we're following, we were following principles that were first discussed in ICHQ3C, where the steps that were followed are essentially four steps to look at the hazard identification by re reviewing all of the relevant data. To the second step is to identify any critical effects or what the target organ or target toxicity is of the exposure. Step three is the determination of a no observable effect level of the, the toxicity studies to, that are considered to be the critical effects or the target organ that's, or toxicity that it has been established. And then the adjustment factors are used to account for various uncertainties or and they're also termed modifying factors to allow for the variability of the study, quality of the study data or duration or the information that's available. There are Five factors that are typically used in this. If a NOEL if a NOEL is available, so a no observable effects level is available, that's the gold standard for the toxicity study. Uh, and that is often multiplied then by a weight adjustment. So in this case, we're using 50, we used 50 kilos per individual for daily um, daily adjustment or weight adjustment, I'm sorry, for daily exposure. The various factors are described underneath the equation here. F1 is an interspecies, so if the that's a conversion factor to convert from the species of interest from whether it's a mouse study, a rat study, to a human exposure. So ex extrapolating from the animal species exposure to the human toxicity exposure. Inter-individual variability, that's a factor that is applied depending on the variation 
seen in the study and also to assume that there is natural variation in the populations. F3 is the fa a factor that is adjusted, used to adjust between the toxicology exposure and the time exposure of the patient. For example, if the tox uh, exposure study was only five days dosing out of seven and the expected administration of the drug is for seven days, that would be a factor that would be applied to adjust for that difference in the exposure in the animal study to the potential exposure in humans. F4 is a modifying factor that is used to determine the severity of the toxicology effect, and that's whether it's a chronic effect, a carcinogenic effect, or uh, mild irritation, for example, could be a factor that used to weight the study, the PDE appropriately. And finally, F5 is a final factor that if a no observable effect level is not established in tox studies, it's an additional uh, margin of safety factor, essentially, to ensure the the data is protective of all patient populations. Walking through this for cadmium, our oral cadmium, um, I'm sorry, this is a cadmium example for parenteral PDE to calculate the parenteral PDE in this case. The best study that was available was a 12-week study in rats uh, that established a 0.6 milligram per kilo dose uh, that caused toxicity. It was a decrease in body weight, increased urine volume, and urinary markers were seen at that dose level. This was a low ob lowest observable adverse effect level, so it was not a no well was not established in this study. So if we look at the combination of the safety factors, uh, again, the dose per day that was, was identified as the low well is 0.6 mg per kilo. This was, a, this was a case of a five day per week exposure. So that had to be adjusted to reflect a seven day exposure for a chronically administered drug. And then finally, the following safety factors were used based on the study that was used. So F1, the fa a factor of five was used at, for extrapolation from rats to humans. For F2, a factor of 10 was applied to account for individual variability in the study, patient, animals study itself. Factor F3, a factor of five, was used because it was a three-month study, so it was a shorter in duration than would have been desired. A six-month or a 12-month study would have been a better study, a more, more effective study to evaluate the long-term toxicity. F4, a factor of five, was chosen because cadmium is a carcinogen by inhalation. However, this is subcutaneous, but a, it's not was unclear and there was some uncertainty of whether or not this would be relevant for parenteral, so we added an additional factor five for a, a little an increased margin of safety. And then finally, a factor of 10 was included because a low, lowest of observable adverse effect level was identified, not a NOL, so we used an, a factor of 10 to correct for that, um, the failure to achieve an, a NOL. In this case, that all calculates out to 1.7 micrograms per day, which we rounded up in the guidelines of the parenteral PDE for cadmium is two micrograms per day. Finally, as any who have followed alimony purities for, for any period of time, the data that's available can be pretty sparse in some cases. So where we had limitations of data, where we had oral bail, some oral bioavailability information, we would provide just additional uh, adjustment factors for parental inhal inhalation routes of administration, especially where the oral bioavailability was less than 1%, a modifying factor was used of 100. If the oral bioavailability was between 1 and 50%, uh, the modifying factor of 10 would divide, we would divide the PDE by 10. <clears throat> Again, can go through the all the calculations, but in each case, we're trying to be a, be conservative, but to es establish a meaningful and a reasonable limit for the appropriate toxicity of the materials moving forward. Where possible, if bioavailability data or occupational inhalation studies or parenteral studies were available, we would use those. If not available, this the approach that was taken was to calculate the oral PDE and then divide that PDE by a modifying factor of 100 to ensure a safety factor moving forward for the 
or for the parenteral and inhalation routes of administration. <clears throat> All this summed up into identifying 24 elements and parsing them into th essentially three classes with one of the classes having two subclasses. For class one, these are the, they have gone by many names over the years, the big four. Uh, they're really four elements with significant human toxicity and limited or no valuable use in pharmaceuticals. <clears throat> and their presence can be variable and widely uh, distributed throughout many different products and excipients and materials throughout uh, the distribution. These are arsenic, cadmium, lead, and mercury. Class two elements are those elements that are used as um, <clears throat> in manufacturing, but have different routes depending on the, the route of administration of the drug product. There's a relatively high probability of occurrence of the class two elements in the drug product because of their natural abundance in the environment and in materials throughout that are used in pharmaceutical processes. And they would, those elements will require assessment across all potential sources and routes. Class B to 2B elements have a lower probability of occurrence in the environment and they can be excluded from, from the further assessment and in the drug product assessments that we'll get to in a few minutes unless they're intentionally added as components in that are used in the manufacture of the drug product. And then the class three elements are those that are have low toxicities by the oral route, and they may need to be included in assessments for parental in inhalation routes, depending on the specific element in, of concern and the PDE established for that. The PDEs that were established, this is a table A21 from the guideline. This is just a summary. I'm not going to go into it in great detail to go through it, but you can see the range and you see can, can see the ranges of the toxicities of the various different classes. So the class one elements, the oral PDEs, parenteral and inhalation PDEs are very, very low or lower than the others. And if we go all the way up to the uh, class threes, for example, they have the highest level permitted uh, in as inclusion of an element of purity in materials moving forward. So the toxicology subgroup came through with the PDEs and established the quality, the toxicity level, the PDEs. Now the quality subteam needed to look at how do we interpret this for industry and regulators to make it available and make it help us understand how we can look at that. So the quality sub team of the expert working group looked at the potential sources of elemental impurities and developed risk assessment approaches to determine where and when additional controls may be required in the drug product manufacturing. So the team went about looking at uh, a series of approaches and series of concepts to try to get at this handle. Now, thinking back to the 2008, 2009, 2010 timeframe, very little data was known about the levels of elemental impurities in components of drug products or the drug products themselves. So we were developing the data as we were developing the process to assess elemental impurities in drug products. The process is defined to look at various different sources of elemental impurities that may find their way into the drug product. This can come from the materials that are used to manuf manufacture the drug product can come from manufacturing equipment, utilities, and or container closure systems. So it was important to look at where would the contributing factors be to include elemental impurities in the drug product. The other step that we included in the guideline is some basic steps on how to pursue a, a risk assessment as well as how to document it and what should be kept in the hands of the company and what should be submitted as part of a dossier uh, to provide an explanation of the assessment that was completed. If we, when we consider this potential source of elemental impurities, five main categories really popped up. The excipients, the drug substance, the utilities, the manufacturing equipment, and the container closure system. If we look at utilities, really water is the primary utility of potential concern. There are metals present, elements present in water, it, depending on the quality of the water that is used in the manufacturing process. 
The product assessments to evaluate the potential for elemental impurities in the drug products should be looking at where each of these may have a contributing factor to elemental impurities moving forward in the process. There are two different potential approaches to do, conducting an elemental impurity product risk assessment. They are to one, look at the drug product itself. In most cases, this is an analysis. So analyzing the drug product it doesn't have to start there. In general, the process is to look at the formulation type and evaluation the container closure system, as well as the inputs into that drug product. But ultimately, in any of the risk assessments, some data is gonna be needed at some point. The most popular, and potentially the, the most relevant approach to gain the most under, the greatest understanding of the elemental impurity profile of the drug product is really to understand the elemental impurity, impurity profile for each of the components of the drug product, whether that be the API, the excipients, or the container closure systems. By approaching and understanding of each of those, you can assess each component for potential sources of elemental impurities or for potential elemental impurities, and you can identify them by narrowing it down to where those sources are. It can also provide a benefit and an advantage in establishing control strategies moving forward to eliminate elemental impurities that are identified in the drug product as either real or potential. Regardless of the approach taken, the elemental purity classification that I mentioned previously, class one, class two, class three, is the starting point for any product risk assessment. And that's summarized in table 5.1 in the guideline which in this case, if you look at the, this table, we can see that the elements listed in the, in the guideline are highlighted here along with the classes. If an element in the list is intentionally added during the manufacturing process, then it has to be considered in the risk assessment. If it's in an oral product, but it's not intentionally added, only the class one and two A elements need to be considered in the product risk assessment. For parenteral, the elements of concern are highlighted here. It's again, class one, class two A, with the addition of lithium, antimony, and copper for parenteral products. Those need to be included in the product risk assessment. So understanding the potential for any of those elements to be included. The list for inhalation for those materials that are elements not intentionally added in the process includes the one and two A elements, as well as many of the class three elements as they have more significant toxic effects in the inhalation route than they do in the other routes. But this is a fundamental table that we recommend being referenced in the summary of the product risk assessment of this is the starting point for any risk assessment for a drug product moving forward. Regardless of whether an, an individual or a company is following the drug product assessment approach or the component approach, the first step is gathering information on the drug product, or in the case of the component approach, gathering the information on the drug product, the components of the drug product, the excipients, the API manufacturing process. That information then is summarized, tabulating the potential elemental impurity concentrations of drug product, and then do any assessment to determine if any of those elemental impurities exceed the PDE that's established for exposure in the final drug product. Now, one thing I do want to emphasize is many folks have said, well, if I do a risk assessment and there's nothing, I, I you know, I believe there's n there are no elemental impurities in there. I haven't done any testing, don't have any data. I'm just using uh, process knowledge and maybe some literature. Do I need to generate data? And in all cases, the, the discussions I've had with regulators are there needs to be some data from somewhere to document what was done. It doesn't have to be exhaustive, but we need to, this needs to be a data-driven exercise as well. But if we look at the four options from a product risk assessment, there are four different scenarios that can happen. Once you do the assessment, whether or not there's going to be an elemental purity present or the level it, that it may be in, there are four different scenarios. One is the elements impurities can be excluded from the risk assessment using table 5.1. They don't have to be considered any further. On the other side, in assessing the elemental impurities that may be present, 
their totals exceed the PDE in the drug product, then that is a clear indicator that additional controls may need to be put in place to reduce those levels below the PDE. There are two other scenarios, elemental impurities that may be present below the control threshold in the drug product. Now, I haven't talked about the control threshold yet. That's 30%, that's a number, that's a, an exposure level where PDE, let's just say a total daily exposure of the elemental purity of 30% of the PDE. So if you do your assessment and calculate the elemental impurity presence, and it's below 30% of the control threshold, no additional controls need to be play, put in place. The one that causes the more challenges than not are those that are present that are above 30% of the PDE, but below the PDE. So a lot of factors need to be considered in there. The variability of the material, how much information is known about the level and the, the level variability of the level in that material, the sources, the variability in the sources, and how close it is to either one of those values. So that's a, an area that the type of assessment that we'll need to spend a little bit more time on in evaluating the absolute level of an elemental impurity moving forward and whether or not controls are needed. So if we do a little bit deeper dive into each one of these categories, for example, if elements, elemental impurities excluded from the risk assessment, this would be class 2B elements that are not intentionally added. So if you remember from table 5.1, these elements don't need to be considered unless they are intentionally added. In this example of solid oral drug product, only class 3 elemental impurities were evaluated, none were intentionally added, and therefore were not considered in the risk assessment. So those were not required to be assessed. For an elemental impurity that may be present below the control threshold in the drug product, in this category, they have the potential to be found, but they're at very low levels. So an example would be lead as a potential impurity in titanium and dioxide. If the formulation contained 10 milligrams of titanium oxide in a one gram tablet, and the lead level was observed was one to 10 micrograms per day, per gram, sorry, the total amount of lead contribution to the drug product would be 0.01 to 0.1 microgram per day, significantly less than the control threshold of lead, and therefore no additional controls need to be provided for the, the drug product for lead in this case, if lead, titanium dioxide was the only source of lead in the drug product. For elemental impurities that may exceed the control threshold but are below the PDE in the drug product, lead is a potential impurity in potassium chloride, for example, potassium carbonate. If the formulation contained 500 milligrams of potassium carbonate in a one gram tablet and the observed level was one to eight micrograms, the total of amount of lead could be 0.5 to four parts per million. That range is very close to five micrograms per day which is the, the lead limit for an oral dosage form. Therefore, additional work may need be needed to ensure that those levels are maintained below, at or below the PDE. And then finally, as I, I've mentioned earlier, if imp elemental impurities are predicted or, or determined to exceed the PDE in the drug product, it's gonna be necessary to evaluate additional controls. In this case, cadmium is a potential impurity in calcium phosphate, again, assuming a 500 milligram calcium phosphate in a 750 milligram tablet, that would translate to a level of five to six micrograms of cadmium in the each tablet, which would exceed, in all cases, the five microgram per day PDE. When putting together a risk assessment, um, and documenting it, the assumptions, risks that are considered and identified, controls that are inherent in the process and product should be evaluated and documented. Data where is available and estimated levels when literature or published data or calculations are used to justify the exclusion of elemental impurities or inclusion for further consideration should be do documented also. The rationale for elemental impurity clearance steps, for example, in API manufacturing, you may have a number of purification steps that may enhance the removal of elemental impurities. 
can be uh, should consider use of compendial quality components that may have requirements and standards and limits for these materials for elemental impurities moving forward. Consideration of GMP controls that are in place to ensure the or minimize ensure the prevent or prevent or minimize the elemental impurities in the drug product. And finally, a discussion of any additional controls to be considered when developing the, the drug product control strategy. For biotechnologically derived products, the guideline clearly states it's recognized that the risk for elemental impurities in biological products is very low because the, the general approaches to manufacturing of these as well as purification steps, however, it's not zero. So it still needs to be assessed, but it is generally a low risk drug product moving forward. And I apologize if I'm running through this fast because I am running behind here, but I will uh, do my best to try not to make this crazy. Uh, documentation to be in the, maintained in the company, pharmaceutical quality system, or to be submitted. Our recommendation is to summarize the product risk assessment, what the process was used, how it was uh, implemented, what was done, a summary of the identified element of impurities and the observed projected level or projected levels, data from representative commercial or pilot scale batches, whether you're taking the component or drug product approach as appropriate, and then the conclusion of the drug product assessment. That should be in the submission for any product moving forward. The details and complexity of that is uh, up to the individual submitters. However, uh, I have seen a, a range in this from we completed the assessment and there's no risk, which provided no data to be able to be evaluated by the regulator to having a, a 75 page document submitted. So I think there's a happy medium. And on the ICH website, we actually have several case study examples of what potential uh, regulatory dossiers could look like. It's not a standard, it's not a template, but it's an example of what can be done. Um, Consideration in determining product risk assessment approaches. There are two approaches, as I've said. These are outlined in some detail in the, the presentation. I will, I'm going to skip over some of this because it's a little bit repetitive, but I wanted to have the information available for folks to go back to. There are two different approaches. Again, drug product or component-based assessments. Both provide information. My opinion and that of many regulators, as I said, the component approach or understanding the elemental impurity profile of the components of the drug product leads to a better understanding and a better understanding of where controls need to be put in place. But if we look at a drug product assessment approach, you're looking again at two main sources that can affect the drug product, the final drug product itself and the container closure system. This risk assessment focuses on data for the elemental impurities in the drug product and whether or not anything can contrib be contributed from the container closure system. Preliminary assessment of the data, this is generally the drug product in this case pretty much has to be tested to evaluate the potential for those elements that are significant in the process and an assessment of the process and use of table 5-1 can limit that as far as the number of elements that need to be evaluated. It's not 24, it's not all of the elements, it's those that are appropriate for the respective drug product and its route of administration. The data that's recommended in the guideline is data generated from three representative production scale lots or six, represent, six representative pilot scale lots. That is sufficient in some cases, but it depends on the variability of the data that is generated. So higher vari variability of elemental impurities in the drug product would result in most likely additional required testing to get a handle on the variability, especially if the limits or the levels seen are close to the PDEs. For container closure systems, it's very dependent on the type of drug product, as is uh, somewhat obvious, solid oral dosage forms. There is no potential for elemental impurities to be transferred from a solid material to a solid material in the container closure system. Therefore, for solid oral dosage forms, the container closure systems can be excluded from further uh, consideration. 
For liquid suspensions and semi-solids, that's not always the case. You can have leaching of elemental impurities from those container closure systems. So it will depend on what information is available from those leaching studies to determine if there's a contribution from the container closure system. This is a table that from a FDA publication that actually shows some uh, po relative potential for inclusion of elemental impurities introduced in the drug product from the container closure system versus the specific drug product classes. And some examples, for example, a high relative potential is injections and ejectable su suspensions. Glass containers present a potential to leach arsenic, for example. The evaluation, again, is simply a summary of the data from the testing results, as well as the container closure system results, and if the daily amount of the elemental impurity is equal to or less than the PDE, then no additional controls may be required. Uh, it depends on how close the values are to the PDE, whether or not that is going to be the final conclusion based on a final assessment. Um, again, if the elemental impurity level identified as less than 30% of the PDE, most no additional controls are deemed necessary as included as guidance in the guideline. If the elemental impurity is greater than the control threshold but not, doesn't exceed the PDE, additional measures may be needed to ensure the level does not exceed the PDE. This is dependent again on where the level is in that range and also the variability. If the elemental impurity does exceed the PDE, additional measures should be included to ensure that, that does, the elemental impurity does not exceed the PDE. When it, additional measures are not feasible or unsuccessful, unsuccessful, can't modify the process, or in the case of, for example, mined excipients, you may not be able to control the level due to the region or the location of where that material came from, then there are other potential ways to modify that, and a recommendation is to have that discussion with the respective regulators to come up with the strategy moving forward. And this is actually a good uh, segue into the ICHQ3D expert working group developed a number of training modules and they are available on the ich.org website as well and they have examples of how to do this and what recommendations are there. I'm going to skip through the component approach component based approach it's very similar to the drug product on this case you're gaining more information about all of the potential contributors. The main contributors are excipients and drug substance in in this approach because they are generally found to be the most likely sources of elemental impurities, but it also is significant to consider if there are any other potentials as we did for the drug product earlier. So I'm going to move on um, briefly here. The amount of information has really expanded over the years. Uh, these are some of the publications on some of the sources of commercially available. There's a, a database managed by LASA that has a database now of more than 2,000 data points, and I believe it's approaching 150 or 200 excipients with information on elemental impurities in excipients using validated methods. There have been several publications on elemental impurities, and the amount of information we know today is significantly higher than we did even five years ago. And we're fortunate because what we're seeing in nearly every case is elemental impurities are not a significant issue. We haven't seen a lot of materials. We've seen several where the PDEs were exceeded and additional controls had to be put in place. But by and large, the elemental impurities needed to be assessed, but we're, we're fortunate that we're not seeing that and therefore the public and patients are being protected with our current processes in place. So I want to move on before I run out of time and talk a little bit about where we are in moving forward. So we have uh, a couple things first. Let me just stop here. The guideline built in a life cycle approach says so new information should drive the assessment. Uh, we need to review the risk assessment revise it and review the control strategy and update the control strategy as new information comes forward. It's standard life cycle management. Additional resources for the expert working group uh, developed by the expert working group are 
seven, eight modules for providing additional information on how to address elemental impurities. The case studies are interesting documents in that they go through, as I mentioned before, what a submission could look like and what an internal risk assessment doc document could look like. Finally, I just want to spend a few minutes, the remaining minutes, talking about the scope of the guideline that's being extended. It's being extended to include cutaneous and transcutaneous routes of administration. The scope and objectives remain the same as ICHQ3DR1. R2 is focused only on cutaneous and subcutaneous routes of administration, and it provided error corrections for several of the PDEs where additional information and interpretations came through. The cutaneous and subcutaneous safety information has been added as an appendix to the original document and is available for, for review currently. The dermal absorption obviously is dependent on the properties of the skin, the anatomical site, the nature of the chemical applied and characteristics of the application. The a generic approach was adopted to establish limits as opposed to an element by element basis due to there's very little safety data for cutaneous routes of administration. Where there is no indication of local toxicity in skin, in general, that's a, a, a finding for most of the element of con, impurities and concern, with the exception of uh, several elements that are sensitizers. The available in data indicates the elemental impurities are poorly absorbed through intact skin, even the presence of enhancers. So we don't have to worry about rapid absorption through the skin. Uh, I wanna highlight some of the concerns. Two different things were developed for uh, approaching cutaneous PDEs. One is a cutaneous modifying factor that was derived to be protective for two specific elements, which do have some potential uh, concerns for absorption through skin, and that's arsenic and thallium. Both have some marginal data, but additional safety factors are applied for the, the, the cutaneous, subcutaneous PDEs on those elements. If we look at the cutaneous PDEs for um, PDEs other than thallium and arsenic, the cutaneous modifying factor was selected as 10. The others were at 100. Uh, for arsenic, these are the levels shown here. And I know I'm flying through this very quickly and I apologize for that. A um, lot of information here and I'm happy to answer any questions. These are currently proposed draft cutaneous PDEs. They are uh, in circulation for public comment and the expert working group is currently revising the guideline or reviewing the public comments and with the target of January of 2022 for a um, publication of step four. One thing I wanna highlight here is the addition of the CTCL here, which is a cutaneous modifying factor for those elements that have sensitization potential. Sensitizers are not just a total dose, but also a concentration dependent, um, have a concentration dependency. So an additional factor was applied to cobalt and uh, Nickel, sorry, moving forward. So product assessments for cutaneous products will be prepared following the guidance provided in Q3D section five. So that hasn't changed. The, for nickel and cobalt, the concentration of the drug product should be assessed relative to the control CTCL, which I just showed. Nickel and cobalt level, as long as it's at or below the PDE and the concentration is below the CTCL, then there is no additional controls are needed. The control threshold approach that was introduced in re release one, revision one, is still in place here. Uh, so at this point, step two for ICH Q3D R2 has been approved and was published for public comment. Not all publication, public participating countries have finished their reviews yet. The ICHQ3D Expert Working Group is working on those comments, as I said. Anticipated sign-off is planned for January of 2022. So I would like to thank the ICHQ3D Expert Working Group for their contributions. The original guideline, they're a great team to work with. 
training materials and the current revision. And I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak tonight or this afternoon. And I am sorry if I ran through that too quickly, but I'm happy to answer any questions. And the organizers will have my contact information if I can answer any follow-ups as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was very extensive uh, presentation. Let us move on to the Q&A session. So do we have questions from the on-site participants? Um, if not, I will move to the questions posted by the offline participants. I will uh, ask two questions because of the time constraint. Um, the question comes from uh, Ms. Kim Lana. Based on the risk assessment, we do not have the elemental impurities in the release specs specification, but we uh, plan to change the packaging container. If that is the case, and if we want to implement such change, what do we have to consider in risk assessment strategy? If your original risk assessment strategy identified that there was an issue with the container closure system, or that it had any elemental impurities included in the drug product, you would have to reassess that with the new materials. Thank you very much for the response. Next question by Yu Chang Hun. When chemical components and herbal components are included in the same product, uh, is it subject to the uh, elemental impurities assessment? That's a good question. I would say that because you have a chemical material, you would still be in scope. It depends on how the regulator evaluates that material. If they evaluate as a herbal, then it's it would not be in scope. If it's evaluated as a drug, it would be in scope. If Thank you for the response. Once again, I'd like to appreciate Dr. Uh, Schweiger for your participation. Thank you very much.